you know, what America's done is done. Understand? When God is not going to hear your prayers, and God is not going to hear those those prayers, that's against Him. Understand? They haven't repented. You understand? But God always chooses a remnant that will turn towards Him and, and will do do the will. But not perfect. Just like I'm, just like I'm, I'm perfect, man. You know. And I, I need him every day. But, you know, this is sad. America is begging for judgment, understand? For destruction. So, I'm going to let you listen to um, a man, you know, David Reagan of uh, Lamb and Lion Ministries. And, uh, and this is The Watchman. And see what he got to say. This is the outcome. The ultimate fate of our nation would be the same. The election would determine only the pace at which we would encounter that fate. I believe that fate would be slowed by the re-election of President Trump. And I was confident that it would be accelerated by the election of Joe Biden. I still feel that way. Here now is the presentation I made. Is there any hope for our nation, or have we passed the point of no return? Is our fate sealed? Are we destined for destruction? Or could there be a spiritual revival that would turn the hearts of our people back to God? The question is, what is God doing in America? Twenty years ago, at the beginning of this century, my answer to this question would have been, He is calling us to repentance. Today, my answer is very different. My answer today is that he is warning us of his impending wrath. My answer has changed because I believe America is finished. I believe we have passed the point of no return. And for those who think there is no such thing as a point of no return, let me assure you that the Bible clearly teaches there is such a point in history, in the history of a nation. The Bible refers to it in several places as, quote, the point where the wound becomes incurable. Look it up. The ancient nation of Judah is a classic example. Jeremiah declared that its wound was incurable because of its rebellion against God and his word. And because of that, Jeremiah was told three times not to even pray for the nation. God even told Jeremiah that the intervention of persons as godly as Moses and Samuel could not save the nation from his wrath. Ezekiel was told the same thing. God declared to him repeatedly that the prayerful intervention of Noah, Daniel, and Job would be insufficient to save Judah from his wrath. Like ancient Judah, we are currently a nation in all-out, full-scale rebellion against God and His Word. We have reached that point that characterized the lawless days of Israel during the time of the nations ruled by judges when the Bible says everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We have abandoned the counsel of Solomon, who wrote in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God. We are far down the road to becoming a mirror image of Noah's depraved society that was characterized by violence and immorality. As in the declining days of Judah, we have become like that nation when God condemned them through the prophet Isaiah with these words, You are calling good evil and evil good. We are, in fact, in the last stage of God's abandonment wrath, as explained by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. In that passage, Paul declares that when a nation sets its jaw against God, he will step back, lower the hedge of protection, and allow sin to multiply, resulting in an immoral sexual revolution, which is exactly what happened in this nation in the 1960s. Then... Romans 1 says that if the nation refuses to repent, God will take a second step back, lower the hedge of protection even more, and the result will be a plague of homosexuality. Thus, homosexuality is not just a sin, it can also be a judgment. And it is a judgment that God has inflicted on this nation. Finally, Romans 1 says that if the nation still refuses to repent, God will take a third step back, lower the hedge of protection further, and the result will be the abandonment of the nation to a depraved mind. Folks, that's exactly where we are today. And that is
That's the reason we are hearing constant cries for things that would have been unimaginable only a few years ago. Let me give you some examples. The defunding of the police. In other words, the undermining of the barrier between us and the barbarians. People calling for the emptying of jails and prisons in order to provide counseling instead of punishment. The payment of slavery reparations to blacks. In other words, payments to people who have never been a slave from people who have never owned a slave. The payment of reparations to homosexuals for having outlawed homosexuality in the past and for having prevented homosexuals from marrying. Legalizing prostitution and even pedophilia to consenting children. Legalizing all hard drugs as the state of Oregon has just done. Legalizing euthanasia and infanticide. Promoting drag queen story hours for children in our public libraries. Mandating public school curricula that teaches from the kindergarten level that various forms of sexual perversion are normal. Legalizing punishment for hate speech, which would include criticism of sexual perversion and abortion or even declaring Jesus to be the only way to heaven. Confinement of all vestiges of religious expression to houses of worship, taxation of churches and ministries, forcing churches and ministries to hire people who disagree with their creedal statements, confiscation of firearms, defunding of the military. Yes, folks, there are people actually making this demand. Removal of chaplains from the military packing the Supreme Court to assure a liberal majority, a constitutional amendment to abolish the Electoral College, the abandonment of nationalism in favor of a one-world order, the mandatory abandonment of fossil fuels, the dumping of any support for Israel, the revision of American history to disparage our Christian heritage and to present us as the world's greatest evil, replacing the Star Spangled Banner as our national anthem with John Lennon's song Imagine, which celebrates atheism and socialism. The list goes on and on, and every time I think it could not get any worse, it gets even worse. And what is the church in America doing in response? It has gotten in bed with the world, endorsing homosexuality and same-sex marriage and ordaining both homosexuals and transgenders. Christian spokesmen all across our nation endorsing horrors like abortion and euthanasia. Christian leaders, even some calling themselves evangelicals, arguing there are many roads to God and Jesus, therefore, is only one of many ways to heaven. Christian spokesmen condemning foreign mission work on the grounds that it constitutes quote-unquote cultural imperialism. Christian pastors building their sermons around modern psychology rather than the word of God. Christian teachers and preachers openly mocking the Bible as outdated, culturally compromised, and full of myth, myth, legend, and superstition. The church today in America is 1,000 miles wide and one inch deep. The average Christian has no idea what the fundamentals of the faith are. Most could not name the first five books of the Bible or the four Gospels. We are in the midst of a famine of the Word of God. It is no accident that the nation's largest church, the Lakewood Church in Houston, is pastored by a person who preaches positive thinking and financial prosperity. That's Joel Again, Austin. the church in America has gotten in bed with our depraved society seeking the approval of people rather than God. In fact, the basic problem of our nation is that we have forgotten God. In 1983, Alexander Solzhenitsyn declared that all of the Russia under the communists were due to the fact that the Russian people had forgotten God. And he pointed out in 1983 that our nation was on the same track. This was the fundamental problem of ancient Judah. Isaiah expressed it this way in chapter 37, verse 10, when he wrote, You have forgotten the God of our salvation and have not remembered the rock of your rest. Many well-meaning pastors in America today are preaching the hope of national revival. I understand their hearts and I appreciate their hope. But folks, I believe it is unrealistic and unbiblical to believe our nation can return to God. They point to the past 
when several times our nation grew cold in its relationship to God, and each time people prayed for revival, and revival occurred. But there is a big difference today. Our nation has not grown cold in its relationship to God. On the contrary, our nation is in outright, full-scale rebellion against God and His Word. We are collectively shaking our fist at God and mocking Him. To put it very bluntly, we as a nation are not giving God the cold shoulder. We are giving Him the finger. Another reason I cannot believe in a national revival is because I believe we are now in the end times, yeah. on the way, on the very threshold of the Great Tribulation. And nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, is there any prophecy about some sort of great end time revival. It just doesn't exist. Instead, the Bible states over and over and over again that in the end time society will become as immoral and violent and the church will be filled with apostasy and will be preaching doctrines of demons. Yeah. In 2016, God granted this nation a window of grace with the election of Donald Trump. Despite his background, his very worldly background, and his highly offensive personality, he stood for Judeo-Christian principles in his legislation, regulations, and court appointments. He slowed our nation's descent into the pit of hell. But as our recent national election has just demonstrated, that descent cannot be stopped. It can only be slowed. Evidence of that can be seen in the following facts. First, despite being the most ungodly president in American history, Barack Obama left office within six, with a 60% approval rate. His designated successor, Hillary Clinton, received 3 million more votes than Trump. Third, the millennials, the future of our nation, supported a socialist in the primaries and then voted for Hillary in the general election. And this year they did the same thing by giving their support to Bernie Sanders and then to Biden. And worst of all, polls are showing that only 9% of Americans can now be classified as Bible-believing. And even worse, those same polls are showing that only 17% of professing Christians can be classified as Bible-believing. Our churches are full of professing Christians who have never been born again. They are actually cultural Christians who are going to church as a cultural habit. And when the rapture occurs, they will still be here going to church, hearing apostate sermons by deceived pastors who will also be left behind. Even many Bible-believing Christians refuse to face the harsh reality of our nation's future. They seem to think God is, is sitting on His throne wrapped in an American flag with no intention whatsoever of pouring out His wrath on our God-rejecting nation. Exactly. They are like the people in Jeremiah's time who responded to his calls for repentance and his warning of God's impending wrath by chanting, the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple. What they meant by this chant? Before, before I go there, I know exactly what you're what you talking about. And the person I'm talking about is Sickle Woods and, and people like him. I had to put it out there, y'all. Listen. Was that they did not believe God would ever allow the temple to be destroyed where his Shekinah glory resided. And likewise, many Christians today believe God would never never allow this nation to be destroyed. Well, folks, we need to remember a biblical principle that says to those to whom much is given, much is expected. Our nation has been blessed more than any other nation in history except ancient Judah, and yet despite our incredible blessings, we have turned our backs on God, and we are begging for His wrath, just like the people of Judah, and God destroyed their nation. Why would He deal it with us any different? I went to the Soviet Union in 1991, shortly after the collapse of the communist government. What I found astonished me. All the stores in Moscow were empty. There was no food, there was no clothing, there was nothing. Overnight, the nation with the largest number of nuclear weapons in the world had been reduced to a third world state as tens of thousands of Russians were in the streets with card tables stacked with items to trade because the nation had been reduced to a border economy and so people were trading clothing for food and food for clothing. And as I surveyed this incredible scene, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, David, go back, go back to America and tell them people what you have seen. Tell them how I destroyed a nation overnight and warn them that the same fate awaits America. But even worse, because of the blessings I have given your nation, tell them that to those to whom much is given, 
much as expected. Well, folks, when I returned, I began to preach that message, and people let me know in no uncertain terms that they did not want to hear what they labeled as a negative message. In the year 2000, I published a book titled Living for Christ in the End Times, and the subtitle I gave it was Coping with Anarchy and Apostasy. That was the year 2000. The publisher refused to use that subtitle. I was told that it was too extreme, too radical. Instead, the publisher gave the book a subtitle that meant nothing at all. When we republished the book in 2015, a revised edition, we took it away from the publisher and we published it ourselves. And I gave it the subtitle that frankly expressed what our society was going to be like, a society caught up in anarchy and apostasy. Amen. Can anyone deny those realities today, just five years later? Our nation was based on Judeo-Christian principles. Our constitutional system of representative government was designed with the assumption that there would always be a Judeo-Christian consensus. Our founding fathers stated clearly that if that consensus ever ceased to exist, our constitution would not be able to stand. Well, my friends, we have arrived. The Judeo-Christian consensus that made this nation great is gone, and our days are numbered. A few years ago, this point was made very powerfully in a brief video produced by a Harvard University Business School professor named Clayton Christensen, who, I am sorry to say, died of leukemia in January of this year, 2020. Let's hear what he had to say. Some time ago, I had a conversation with a Marxist economist from China. He was coming to the end of a Fulbright Fellowship here in Boston. And I asked him if he had learned anything that was surprising or unexpected. And without any hesitation, he said, yeah, I had no idea how critical religion is to the functioning of democracy. The reason why democracy works, he said, is not because the government was designed to oversee what everybody does, but rather democracy works because most people, most of the time, voluntarily choose to obey the law. And in your past, most Americans attended a church or synagogue every week, and they were taught there by people who they respected. My friend went on to say that Americans followed these rules because they had come to believe that they weren't just accountable to society, they were accountable to God. My Chinese friend heightened a vague but nagging concern I've harbored inside that as religion loses its influence over the lives of Americans, what will happen to our democracy? Where are the institutions that are going to teach the next generation of Americans that they, too, need to voluntarily choose to obey the laws? Because if you take away religion, you can't hire enough police. Pay close attention to that last sentence in that video when he said, if you take away religion, you can't hire enough police. In conclusion, folks, is there any hope for our nation? I don't think so. I believe our fate is sealed. Is there any hope for individual Americans? Absolutely. But that hope cannot be found in a political party or a political leader. It can only be found in Jesus. Because I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I can view the future with very strong hope, and that's because I know that God is in control. Psalm 2 says, while all the political leaders of this world are shaking their fists at God and telling him they will do as they please, God is sitting on his throne in heaven laughing. Yes, laughing. He's not laughing because he does not care. No, he is laughing because he has it all under control. For our creator has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate all the evil of man and Satan to the ultimate triumph of Jesus. Keep in mind, too, that the anarchy and apostasy we are witnessing today is clearly prophesied in the Bible as an end-time sign. That's the reason that the great pastor Adrian Rogers would often say, the world is growing gloriously dark. Why would he call increasing moral and spiritual darkness glorious? Because it is a sure sign that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. Jan Markell has always put the same thought another way. She says, the world is not falling to pieces. Instead, all the pieces are falling into place. What are we to do as Christians? What are we to do as we face the increasing chaos all around us, including increasing persecution of both Christianity and individual Christians? We are to remember the words that God spoke to the prophet Habakkuk when he was faced with the
the same situation. God said to him, the righteous shall live by faith. Specifically, we are to commit our lives to holiness. We are to point people to Jesus as their only hope. We are to stand for righteousness. We are to pray earnestly. We are to proclaim the Lord's soon return. And let's keep in mind the immortal words of the prophet Jeremiah, who, when confronted with the horrible destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, the nation, cried out in faith, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Now, what he said is, um, the hope is, you know, we got to proclaim the gospel, tell people about Jesus, pull people to Jesus, understand? And, you know, quit focus on this, uh, you know, wicked politicians and, and, and you know, and, 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 and uh, senators and, and all that, because they had shake their rebellious fists at the face of a holy guy. So, that's uh, David Reagan, by the way, by Lamb and Lime Ministries. I listened to him. I used to listen to him before after watching Jack Vanity P. Rest in Peace. I understand Jack Vanity P. Ministries. <clears throat> and um, all I'm telling you, y'all, is... Um, like you said, you know, the nation has fallen. America is gone. All we got to do is proclaim the gospel. You know, that's what we, that's what me and my wife are going to do right now, starting now. And we will stand against wickedness and stand, stand up for righteousness. Understand? That's what's going on. Now, now that is um, on the, you know, the... The Watchman, and <clears throat> he shows articles and news, you know, pointing to to return to Jesus Christ, and um, you know, all what it says in the Bible is what it is, you know, chaos and lawlessness and all what Jesus has says in there, so. You know, since they're going to beg for judgment, they're foolish. I'm talking about these wicked ones. They're going to realize too late. Too late after we go into the rapture. So, those of you who are not saved, the Bible says to turn to him by repenting of your sins and you and then call upon him and, 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 be, and, mean, it, and mean that you're sorry that you Grieve the Holy God, understand? Because godly sorrow leads to repentance. Second Corinthians 17. Repent. Repentance of sin should be preached in the name of Jesus everywhere. It started with Jerusalem. Luke 24, 27. Repent and be converted. Acts 3, 19. And repent. Every last one of you, and and uh, in the name of Jesus, and and you are uh, receive the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, as two thirty eight. All through the Bible, is telling is cries of repentance. Also in Ezekiel, you know Ezekiel chapter fourteen talks about, you know that they need to repent. So that's what's going on. Other than that, y'all. I'm out of here, y'all. Peace out. Happy New Year.